So we just went through all the pre-Christmas Advent times leading up to the birth of Messiah. Now, we're not going to debate when he was born. We've already been through all that. Most likely it was not December 25th, but if it was great, if it wasn't great, who cares, right? <clears throat> we'll probably find out when we get to heaven when he was actually born. And at that point, you'll be so happy and ecstatic, you'll say, whatever. <laughs> but the question is now, all those prophecies we went over leading up to, especially in Isaiah, leading up to what Messiah was going to do, where he was going to come from, what he was going to be like, how he was going to suffer, right down to the, a lot of details about his birth. And then we didn't do um, we didn't do Epiphany with the wise men coming, but you know we don't know a lot about the wise men. In fact, if you go to the YouTube channel, I put last week's radio show about the Epiphany on as a YouTube too, so you can hear it since we're not going to do it here. But you know we don't know how, even how many wise men there were. You know, people have always assumed there's three because there's three gifts. And so ever since the beginning, it was assumed there were three, but it doesn't say there were three. <clears throat> and as I like to say, you know, maybe there were more of them and they all chipped in for the gifts. You know, I, I don't know. But we don't know a lot about the, the three kings, the magi or whatever you want to call them. But there's one thing we know. They weren't Jews. That's for sure. They came from hundreds of miles away probably in Persia, Saudi Arabia, you know, what was Arabia at that time. So the Messiah was manifested to three Gentiles, which is very profound because if you think about what happened, and I'm not going to redo the whole thing, but when you think about what happened, they went looking for the newborn. We don't know how long it took them to get there, but they went looking for the newborn Messiah. As Gentiles, they went through this arduous trip to get there in jerusalem the people in that whole area didn't even go like the eight miles from jerusalem to bethlehem to see what was going on you know sometimes we meet people that are on long journeys looking for truth and we're supposed to show them christ we're supposed to show them the messiah you know, the wise men thought the Jewish leaders were going to help them find the newborn Messiah, but they didn't have a clue what was going on. And sometimes that happens to us. You know, somebody's looking for Messiah. We're supposed to show them the way. And so in this obscure place, you know, these think about these rich guys from the East brought, you know, gold and frankincense and myrrh. They were obviously, they came from a place of a lot of wealth. And it says they found Mary and the baby. It says, you know, some translations say in a house. Some translations say in the stable. Well, wherever they were, it wasn't the kind of place those guys were used to. <laughs> it wasn't a palace. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't even the Holiday Inn. It, w it was a dump. And one thing, you know, when the, when the wise men get there, they don't say, geez, what a dump. Why did we come all this way to see this? They paid no attention to the surroundings, but they paid him homage, they worshipped him, and gave the gifts. You know, and we find Christ in all different places. You know, we used to find him in garbage dumps in Mexico City. You can find him in places where you don't expect to find him. You don't just find him in big, beautiful cathedrals or, you know, big, beautiful churches or you don't know where you're going to find them. You know, we used to, when we were go to Mexico, we used to always talk about how, if, you know, if Jesus physically came back, he would be ministering to those people in the garbage dump areas and those poor neighborhoods. Not that he doesn't love the rich people downtown, but he had more of a connection to, to the humble people. But... We can't get into one of the ways in our time that the gospel's been hijacked, which is social action. Jesus came to help the poor. Well, he did, because he wants us to help the poor. 
Jesus came to help the disenfranchised people. Well, yes, he did, but he wants us to do it because we love him. He came to save us, and he came so that we can be motivated to do the works of the kingdom. He didn't come like a lot of leaders now say, oh, you know, he died in solidarity with the poor. Well, he had a lot of solidarity with the poor, but that's not why he died. He could have he could have stayed alive till he was 80 years old and helped the poor, like we should be doing. So we talked about the God-man. We talked about Messiah. So, so who is this actually? Who is this actually? And John's gospel tells us at the very beginning. I love the first chapter of John. I love the first chapter of John. Actually, just even the the very beginning. <clears throat> this is the, the first words of it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now, John, what does John call himself? The apostle Jesus loved. John never calls himself by name in his gospel. He refers to himself as the apostle that Jesus loved. They were really close. At the Last Supper, he was leaning up against Jesus. This spring, hopefully, we're going to have Messianic saviors again, especially at our church, but... But, you know, you, when you see pictures of the Last Supper, what actually happened is John's actually leaning against Jesus. They were very close. He was the youngest one. So he has this very close relationship to him. And, you know, John's gospel is so powerful. It's called, you know, the gospel of the signs and wonders. There's the seven I am statements that Jesus makes that gets the religious leaders mad because he was equating himself with God. So John, when he writes his gospel, says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, he's calling Jesus the Word. The Greek word that was up there a minute ago is logos. We got our stupid word logo from that, which is a really cheap thing when you think about the logos as the eternal word. So he equates Jesus with being the Word who was from God and was God and has always been God. Let's say Jesus was born December 25th, just for the sake of argument. Jesus didn't come into existence that night. Or let's back up nine months before that where a human is conceived nine months before they're born, right? So he was conceived by the Holy Spirit nine months before that. Now, is that when he came into existence? No. He's always existed. He was with God in the beginning, and everything was made through him. Nothing was made. Everything was made through him. Everything that was made. There's nothing that's been made that he didn't make. Or the creation didn't come through. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, that applies in the first century. You know, later on in this gospel, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. For the most part, the chosen people didn't accept him as Messiah. The overwhelming number of Jews alive today don't accept him as Messiah. Growing number do, but overwhelming numbers do not. People in our world give lip service to being Christian, but are they really? Do we really see this light, which is the light of men, and it's the light that shines in the darkness? And boy, do we have a lot of darkness. Now, most of us are older here, but... Can you imagine, can you imagine going back 
when we were little kids, let's say let's go back 50 years, 60 years. Can you imagine telling people, well, two men will be able to get married? If you're a boy, you could be a girl. If you're a girl, you can be a boy. Well, there's 58 different genders, so whichever one you want to be. And it's fluid. Today you can be female, tomorrow you can be male. The next day you can be something else. And I have to accept that. I have to accept, and soon it's going to be law. Because now, the new structure in Washington, the first thing they're going to do, well, our very Catholic Joe Biden said, first thing he's going to do is going to go back after the little sisters of the poor. Because after all, you got to go after a bunch of nuns who don't want to pay for abortion and birth control. We're going to take them right back to court. And he said, we're going to make Roe v. Wade a law that it can never be overturned, not just a court decision. So we need light in the darkness. COVID is here because of this, and it's going to keep going. There's no sign of any kind of national repentance. There's no kind of church repentance. The church is going down the same dark hole as the country is, as the world is. So the darkness doesn't comprehend the light. You go on TV and start talking about Jesus. How long are you going to be on the air? About 38 seconds. Then that's going to be it. St. Augustine wrote that those that passage we just read should be written in gold in every Bible. I thought that was cool. I learned that last night when I was making these notes. I thought that was cool. Should be written in gold, the Lagos. How'd you find a gold logos to put up? That's pretty cool. Because it's so majestic. And why did the wise men bring gold? Because he's a king. Why did they bring incense? Because he's worshipped. Why did they bring myrrh? Because he's going to suffer. Myrrh was what you anointed the dead with. If you ever get a chance to study the Song of Songs, which... This is so amazing, I can't even begin to tell you. The groom tells the bride, I have to climb a mountain of myrrh. Which means as Messiah, he has this horrible suffering that he has to do. He says to her, you, you might go over a little bit of myrrh, because during our lives, we go over little bits of myrrh. He has to climb a mountain of myrrh. But, so he's the word, the logos. John uses this many times through his whole gospel. He calls Jesus the Word. He doesn't call him the Messiah. He doesn't call him the Christ. He doesn't call him the Savior. He calls him the Word. Capital W. You keep that in mind. And in ancient Hebrew texts, sometimes commentators refer to God himself as the Word. Call him Word of the Lord. The word of the Lord says this. The word of the Lord says that. And we as Christians know that because we do that too. The word of the Lord says this. word of the Lord says that. So the word is important. Now, all this talk about word, and you know, what does that mean? Well, creation was spoken into existence. God doesn't just will everything to happen. He speaks it out. Let there be light. Let this, let that, let there be the other thing. It's a spoken word, and creation comes into existence at every level. At every level. Then he speaks, he speaks to the sky and makes birds. He speaks to the water and makes all the creatures in the ocean. He speaks to the land and trees and plants and animals come up. But see, if you remember, when he makes Adam, who does he speak to? Himself. He says, let us make man in our own image. So when he makes Adam, he doesn't just say, Adam, come out of the ground. Just like the cows and the sheep and all the other stuff. He speaks to himself. Let us make man, plural. In our, plural, own image. So we have the image of God living in us, right? 
we're not like a dog. Everybody feels bad when their pet dies. And I feel bad when my pets have died. And I know that, you know, when you work with animals, you get attached to them. But they don't have the image of God in them. I mean, a dog is a dog, and he does what he's created to do. You know, people, people used to come all the time and complain about my cats, you know, killing the bird in their yard. Or I go, well, you know, it's a cat. This is what a cat is created for. You can't say to a cat, no, I don't want you killing any birds. <laughs> I don't want him to kill birds either. I don't care if he kills mice. I don't want him to kill birds. But creation is spoken into existence, and mankind, Adam specifically, is made by God's word to himself. To himself. Remember when God, when God says, I swear by myself that this is going to happen. Because God has nobody to swear to other than himself. You know, we go to a court and say, I swear to God that I'm going to tell the truth. So if you tell a lie after you've sworn to God, that's serious business. But God swears by himself, talks with himself. Let's make man. So it says in, in, in Colossians, oops, Colossians 1, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So the word, who is Jesus, holds everything together. Everything was made through him, and for him. All his enemies are going to be under his feet. You know, if you read in Numbers 10, every time the ark started to move, Moses would say, let your enemies flee from before you. You know, when you look around the world, it looks like the enemy's winning. But that's not going to be the final story. And he holds everything together by his power. So everything is spoken in existence through him, and he holds everything together. So the logos, the word, is God. Only God can hold everything together. If Jesus was a good man, that would make zero sense. Right? There's been a lot of good men. You know, John's a good man, but he can't hold the whole world together, every molecule in the universe together. I mean, he wouldn't even try. <laughs> and neither could Tim. No matter how good. <laughs> so it, it can't be a human being that holds everything together, that everything subsists in him. The Word was God, and God was the Word. Paul always uses this word, or John always uses this word, logos. Well, Paul uses it too. And Paul always uses the word doulos, which is a slave, a servant, a bond servant. You know, we don't want to be the slaves of Christ, most of us, right? We want to go on with our lives and do all our stuff. We'll catch him on Sunday morning, or, you know, we'll catch him... 10 or 15 minutes during the day if we, you know, have a prayer time or sit and read the Bible for 10 minutes. But I don't want to be anybody's slave. I want him to just be part of my life. You know, I'm happy when I pray. I'm happy when I do this. It makes me feel better. Well, Paul says, I'm a doulos. I'm a bond servant. I'm a slave to whatever he wants me to do. Paul was living a great life before he became an apostle. You know, Peter probably would have been happy living out the rest of his life fishing and having his little fishing business. And John and James, you know, they had fishing businesses too, and they could have just, you know, lived like everybody else. But they became slaves to him. They became doulos. So the word was God, and God was the word. So Jesus is not some subordinate being. 
that is created, and then he becomes kind of, you know, the senior partner of the universe, or kind of the CEO, or whatever business term you want to use. He's not a subordinate being. When the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, keep some of these things in mind because they think Jesus was created by the Father. And I forget what they think the Holy Spirit is, but it's not what we think he is. So, yeah, some kind of force. Yeah. I had, I, I, had, I had a patient who was a big, I don't want to say big shot, but had a high position in the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know if you ever talked with him. But um, he was a nice guy. We'd go out to lunch and talk. And every time he came in for an appointment and I came in the room, he would say to me, do you still believe in all that Trinity stuff? <laughs> so God created all things, and it, we know God created all things. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that's in them. And it says that everything's created through the word. John says the word is John says the word is Jesus. So through Jesus, everything is created. So therefore, Jesus has to be God. He can't be a subordinate being. He can't be a great philosopher that came to teach us how to live. Well, of course he came to teach us how to live. That's an important part of what he did. But he's not just a philosopher who came to teach us how to live, like Socrates or Aristotle or Confucius or and these other great philosophers. And God would never give his omnipotence to a creature. God would never make a creature all powerful. Right? That would be impossible. Well, maybe not impossible, but he would not do it. I mean, a created being can't create. We're all created beings. We can't create anything. You know, we can, we can build something out of wood and say, I made that. But if you said to Norm, who made this, just come up here and make something right here, but you don't get to use any wood. He could stand there all, for a century and nothing would come. And with all of us, a created being can't create anything. Or else, if Jesus was created there'd be two omnipotent beings. Because that would mean Jesus was separate from the Father, if the Father created him. But if he's omnipotent, then there's two omnipotent beings, not one. You know, the Shema, here is Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The concept of the Trinity is hard to understand. Nobody understands it. But when Jesus says, the Father and I are one, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But if he, there can't be two omnipotent beings. So the word comes down to a being, Jesus, who always existed. And the word that's spoken out, that caused creation, that caused the covenant that he made with Moses, that caused the prophets to prophesy. So when they said, thus says the Lord, they had heard God's voice in some way. Moses heard it directly. When Jesus comes, though, it's a little different because he's the ever-existent God, as John said. He's always existed. And in Hebrews, it says, he talks to us in these last days. If you study the book of Hebrews, and it's my favorite book, and you can read um, chapter one for your homework when you go home. But you know, in chapter one, the writer, whoever he was, maybe it was Paul, maybe it wasn't, probably wasn't, but the writer to the Hebrews says, in the past, God spoke to us through prophets. In other words, everybody got a piece of revelation from God and they said it, right? 
Isaiah said something. Jeremiah said something. Ezekiel said something. They didn't know the whole truth. They were given a word to speak and they spoke it. But the writer says, in these last days, the last days started when Jesus came. This is not like some kind of crazy end times thing. The, <laughs> the last days started when Jesus came. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. In other words, when Jesus came, he was the eternal word in a human body speaking with a human voice. So that God's word became not only audible, like John says in his first letter, we heard him, we saw him, we heard him, we touched him, we hung out with him. We went to Denny's with him in the morning. We stopped for coffee. We all took a little rest when it got hot. But he was the eternal word. He was the eternal God. And we understood what he was telling us. Not always. But when we reflected on it later and when the Holy Spirit comes after, during and after Pentecost, then we understood what he was telling us. Remember, Jesus says when the, the, the other paraclete comes, he's going to remind you of everything that I've said. So I'm sure Pentecost morning, when Peter was out there preaching and all those guys were probably all running around praising and waving their arms around and everybody thought they were drunk, I'm sure inside their mind was they were thinking, oh, now I understand why he told us that. Now I understand what he meant. Because they heard it from a person. They heard it in a way that we hear things. You know, if you're taking a class and you go to a lecture, the teacher or the professor or whatever he is, stands up and he or she stands up in front and teaches the lesson. So you hear a person talking, and you say, oh, oh, yeah, okay, now I get that. Oh, wait a minute, I don't get that. Oh, okay, I get that. You don't hear a, a waterfall's voice. You don't hear a, you know, you don't hear a, a voice inside your head saying E equals MC squared. You hear a professor telling you about it in a voice that you understand. In the wilderness, they saw manifestations. Deliverance from the Egyptians, the Red Sea parting, manna coming every day, water coming when they needed it, meat coming when they needed it, sometimes too much meat, but meat coming when they needed it. Every provision that they needed, they saw. They walked around for 40 years and their shoes and their clothes didn't wear out. They saw manifestations. They heard sounds. They heard the rumbling. They heard the shofar blasts on the mountain. They heard thunder. They saw lightning. They got overwhelmed by the Shekinah glory that covered the mountain. They got scared for a while. Then they built the golden calf. But at first they were scared. They said, we can't deal with this. They saw a manifestation of power, but they didn't see a form. In the book of Deuteronomy, um, chapter 4, it says, one of the reasons that you don't make images is you didn't see a form when I did all these things. You saw things happen, you heard things, but you never saw a form. didn't see a form. Now, when Jesus comes and these guys are hanging around and they're going to Denny's in the morning, getting French toast slams, no bacon, they um, heard him tell them stuff, but more importantly, they saw manifestations. They saw signs and wonders. John is the book of signs and wonders. They saw healings. They saw multiplication of food. They saw him walk on water. They saw him stop the waves and the wind. Uh, 
Is there any, you know, you could probably find some weird animal that can walk on water somewhere. But you don't generally see people walking on water. You don't generally see people multiplying food. We saw that happen in Mexico one time. But I can assure you, none of us did it. <laughs> so they saw signs and wonders, and they heard a human voice. They heard a voice that said, let me tell you guys about the kingdom. Let me tell you guys about the Father. I'm telling you what the Father wants you to know. Let me tell you what things are really like. Let me tell you how terrible sin is. I've come, I love you like the Father loves me. In a human voice. We don't know what his voice sounded like. Sometimes I wonder, like in this, the Sermon on the Mount and stuff, you know, did he supernaturally, you know, project his voice? Because if there were, you know, 5,000 people there, you know, <laughs> you guys were saying the microphone's not on. Imagine that you're on a hill with 5,000 people. The people in the back are going, what's he talking about? <laughs> so I don't know if he somehow projected his voice, but they heard a human being talking. He didn't have some kind of weird cosmic voice or some kind of booming cosmic voice. He had a human voice. And someday we're going to hear it. Might be today, I hope. It's going to be very soon. We're not going to be hanging around here much longer, which is fine with me. And they saw a human form. In the wilderness they saw, God says, you didn't see a form. Now you see a human form. You see a real body. John said, we touched him. We heard him. We saw him. There were probably times where he would sit and roll his eyes and say, I can't believe you guys. Right? Or he'd say, I've had enough for today. i got to go to sleep for a while. Or let's get something to eat. I'm hungry. You know, he tells the woman at the well, I'm thirsty. I need a drink. Because he was a man. He was a man. And, you know, there were times where he would have, you know, what's commonly called righteous anger. You know, like when he turned the tables over and whipped all those guys and let the animals go and all this stuff. Because they weren't supposed to be there doing that. And he, he, most, of the, the, most of his criticism was directed at the religious leaders. Because he says, not only do you not get into the kingdom, but you prevent others from getting in. You know, when you have false teachers in the church today, the church as a whole, not only do they not go into the kingdom, but they prevent other people from going into the kingdom. Remember in the first chapter of James, it says, if any of you want to be teachers, be careful because you're going to be judged at a higher standard because people listen to you. You know, if one of us goes outside in the parking lot and we think, you know what? I don't believe this anymore. I believe this. And we just keep it in our mind that we don't believe this truth anymore. We just believe some well, that's between you and God. But if you get in front of thousands of people and say, you know what, all that stuff you guys learned in Sunday school or catechism or whatever, that's all hogwash. Let me tell you what the truth really is. And you go off on some false teaching. Now you've affected all the people that have listened to you. So it's, it's serious business. But they saw a human form and a real body. Everybody has a voice for the most part, right? You know, Paul said his voice was annoying. You know, he admits he had an annoying voice. You know, some people have high squeaky voices. Some people have deep, nice voices. Some people have whatever. There's all kind of different voices, but most people have a voice. I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> John the Baptist, it said, I don't know if we did, I don't remember if we did that here or not. When it said he came crying in the wilderness, the Greek means he had a shrill, loud voice. 
I don't know if we did that here or not, but it was shrill, loud voice, which is interesting for two reasons. Number one, his father was struck dumb by Gabriel. Important lesson, if Gabriel comes to tell you something, don't be a smart aleck. Because <laughs> Zechariah learned the hard way. <laughs> for, for the next nine months plus eight days, he couldn't talk. And number two is there had not been a prophet for 400 years. You know, it's 400 years of silence. And all of a sudden, a shrill, loud voice comes saying, repent. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. John and Jesus both say, to get into the kingdom, you have to repent. You don't just come in. You don't just wander in any old way you want. You have to repent. You have to admit what you are. You have to admit that you can't undo things that you've done. All you can do is throw yourself at his mercy. And then you can come into the kingdom. So he had a loud, shrill voice. And we have a voice to proclaim the truth just like he did. It doesn't matter whether our voices are, you know, deep and bass, you know, like people who are really good singers, or loud, squeaky, annoying voices. No matter what your voice is, you know the old saying, God gave you a voice so he wants to hear you sing, but I still sing pretty quietly till I get to heaven or if the building needs to be evacuated. So no matter what our voice is, we have to proclaim the truth. Because we've been given the word that we also have to speak out. And the truth is that Jesus is the word. The world doesn't want to hear that because we want to be independent. We want to be masters of our own fate. We want to make the rules. We want to make God in our own image. How many times do you hear people say, well, the God I believe in would never send anybody to hell. I say, well, that's interesting. If hell doesn't exist, Jesus talked about it a lot. Was he talking about a place that doesn't exist? That would be pretty weird. So no matter what your voice is, you have to proclaim the word because that's the truth. So John tells us that he's God and that his existence is before all things. And that word is eternally expressed because he's still holding everything together. Right? At this moment, he may think or will that I've got 18 more breaths left and 10 more heartbeats. Right? And when that happens, it doesn't matter how many doctors are here, doesn't matter how close Parma Hospital is, doesn't matter how fast the paramedics get here, because he holds everything together. Our next breath depends on him. And th so the word is eternally expressed. It's an ongoing because he holds everything together. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night into night reveals knowledge. Even the creation knows his word. You know, all creation is groaning now for Jesus to come back, Paul tells us in Romans, right? All creation is groaning, waiting for him to come back. Because creation's all out of whack. But it says, all the, David writes, King David writes, all these things in the heavens, all his creation still utters his word. Not like the meditation and the um and all that, but his word goes through all the creation. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. So his word has not only created everything, his word goes through the whole universe. His word created 
I love that term, a tabernacle for the sun, a place where the sun's going to be. These are primitive people. You know, David couldn't, God's not going to tell David, well, actually, let me tell you how the solar system works. Because David would have been. So he says he makes a place for the sun. Isn't that cool? By his word. And then he says, in him was life. So he's self-existent. You know, the Jews always talk about the living God. You know, in the name of the living God. Because God is alive. Remember in the 60s, the God is dead, people? Oh, God created everything, and then he died. And so everything is just kind of going, but God's not here anymore because he died. Well, I got news for, well, they probably found out shortly after they died, like 14 milliseconds after they died, that he was very much alive. <laughs> so he's referred to as the living God. It says he speaks life, and he speaks light into the darkness. You know, he tells us to be salt and light. Light, you know, darkness doesn't overcome light. And if this room is pitch black and somebody lights one little candle, the light pierces through the darkness, right? Darkness doesn't come into a thing. Light goes out from a source. And he tells us we're supposed to be salt. You know, to ancient people, salt was very important. That's how they preserved things. You salted the fish. I mean, Peter didn't have like a month to sell the fish he caught. <laughs> he had like hours to sell it. But they salted everything to preserve it. We're supposed to be preserving the world around us, not trying to be like the world. So the eternal word penetrates the darkness, and you hear it through the whole scripture. Because the word is the atonement for sin, and Jesus is the word. And that word goes through the whole scripture. In fact, the scripture is the word. 2 Timothy 3.16. You know, all scripture is God-breathed. He speaks out his word, breathes out his word, and it goes through the whole scripture. Because the whole scripture is about atoning for sin and conquering death. Every single human being has a problem. They're all sinners. Right? Have you ever met anybody who's not a sinner? You ever met anybody who's not a sinner? No. You know, John writes in his letter, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar. You know, you can walk around saying, I don't commit any sins. You're a liar. But the scripture is about atoning for sin and conquering death. And darkness doesn't comprehend it. Because the human heart is basically dark. We don't want to hear that. How many times do your friends, your family, your co-workers say, I don't want to hear that? I used to say that. I don't want to hear that. Many years ago, the pastor of this very church, Pastor Hills, was my patient for a long time. And he was so nice. He went, he went to Israel and brought me something once. He said, I went to Israel, I brought you this. I thought, wow, that's really nice. The guy brought me something. You know, he would tell me things here and there about the church. He'd tell me things here and there about Jesus. And I'd say, oh, that's nice. I hope you guys have a nice time Sunday morning. I'm not going to be there, but I hope you guys have a nice time. Because <clears throat> the human heart is dark. And the light, the only light that can penetrate it is his light. The world can't do that, right? You can leave here and say, you know what? I feel really bad today. I'm kind of depressed. I'm going to stop at Best Buy and get myself some cool electronic thing. And you're going to take it home and go, wow, I got this cool electronic thing. In the next couple of days, you're going to say, wow, I got this cool electronic thing. I'm so happy. Then a week from now, you'll be saying, yeah, you know, it's nice. And a month from now, you'll be saying, oh, yeah, I, you know, I should use this sometime. And a year from now, you don't remember where you put it. Because it only satisfies you for a short time. It doesn't make light in your dark, dark heart. 
because we have a sinful nature and we want to worship ourselves. I don't want, you know, I have a migraine. I need to relax. I need to close my eyes for a while. I don't want to pray. I don't want to read the word. I don't want to go to one of Messiah. Because <laughs> I want to take just take care of myself, right? He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. So even though he made everything, it all went out of whack. And we don't want the light. You know, later on, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So when his light penetrates your heart, you become an adopted son or daughter. You become a family member. <laughs> you know, in Romans and Galatians, Paul says we become co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs. Paul says we're going to judge angels. And I'm waiting for that because I want a really big angel in front of me and say, hey, you, go get me some coffee, a little bit of cream, and a chocolate donut. And he'll go do it. <laughs> and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we talked about this before Christmas. He came and dwelt with us in flesh. The Greek, remember, means he pitched his tent with us. Tabernacle comes from the word for tent. So how cool is that? You know, in, Deuter in, in Exodus, he tells the people, build a house for me, build, build a tabernacle for me so I can live with y'all. Well, he didn't say y'all, but so I can, he can, I, I can come and live with you. He tells David and Solomon, when you have the temple, I'm going to come and live there. But then when Messiah Jesus comes, what happens? He atones for our sin, and when he does that, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, and we become adopted sons and daughters. How cool is that? In Hebrews, it says, you know, he's not a, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren because he's a man. He's a man. He's descended from... Adam and Eve and from Abraham and down the line, right? So he's our brother, and he says, I don't call you slaves anymore. I call you friends, and then I'm going to judge you at some point. Hmm. So our judge is our friend and our brother. So that sounds good <laughs> compared to if he says to you, I don't even know who you are. So the word creates everything keeps everything going. And this is what we should have commemorated during this time that we celebrated the birth of human Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Whew.